the ribbon relief cleanup schedule, there's some uh, 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 flyers there on the back table. And uh, <laughs> haven't been receiving the emails and wish to. Uh, be sure to sign up and give us your email uh, on the uh, sign up sheet that's going around. And then the other thing is uh, Project Bloomer Rescue, which is at Lakeside Nature Center on uh, March 31st, which is a Saturday, the last Saturday. And uh, we will have 500 plus volunteers. We've had as many as 1,000. Uh, we've probably got 20 different sites along the Blue River. Some of them are easy to just walk in the floodplain. Others are, we've got a historic dump that's got cars from the 30s in it. You know, so, and we're, we're going to be doing uh, tree planting, and we'll also be doing a uh, water quality monitoring demonstration, macro uh at 1 o'clock. So, uh, Lakeside Nature Center, registration starts at 8. We give you donuts and juice. Hot dogs at the uh, new. Uh, you want to spend a little bit of time? Come on out. You can spend all day. Come on out. You can't spend any time at all. Send somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for 22 years. We get lots of trash and uh, lots of tires. And uh, have always had a good time. So tonight's presentation is. Uh, you know, we always hear about Lewis and Clark, but uh, Jim Denny uh, retired from, you guys read the email and all that. DNR. From DNR. Thanks a lot. And an uh, author of uh, uh, several books is uh, going to talk to us about uh, Lewis and Clark and before. Some very interesting stuff uh, from the Spanish explorers and uh, areas where uh, dragons used to be. And uh, we know that that is very helpful. So without further ado, Jim Denny. I think we're going to come before, after, in between, and everything today. Uh, uh, I don't know how involved you are with the folks are going to lose a black dice and pay all the way. But it just uh, consumed my life for about four years. And by the time uh, it was finally over in 2006, we had such a case of Lisa Clark burned out, as you wouldn't believe. And since then, you know, I've been trying to figure out just uh, and, I, and I'm assuming that people are not going to be interested in Lexi Clark again for decades to come. But am I wrong about that? I mean, is, is it all forgotten in the Lexi Clark or is it interesting as ever? Or, or did you all get as sick of them as I did? But I don't know. Anyway. We like Lexi Clark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what I've got a long time. But I, I spent a lot of my time kind of thinking, you know, uh, what to take away from the Lexi Clark. What we should be kind of like remembering forever. I mean, I promise this will be my last trick slide here. <laughs> they all know that you know, they went up the Missouri River and then they came back down the Missouri River again. Anyway, <laughs> they're there. Uh, hey, and thanks for coming tonight. That's my show. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, first of all, you know, what did uh, Wilson Clark and Thomas Jefferson know about this river that the uh, Jefferson? Uh, set them to explore. You know, there's a growing in response of the state of Virginia that the Missouri was a major river in the entire northwest, even larger than the Mississippi. Now, the Mississippi is a river that enters the Missouri just above St. Louis, so you would call you know, about the Mississippi. Uh, well, and uh, when was it in my kind of jolly? Uh, uh, first discovered in 1673. Does that sound good mm -hmm. to you? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it's good enough for government work. I used to work for government. Uh, but uh, Mark Hatton Jolly was the first one of the first Western eyes to gaze upon the Missouri River. And he also attempted uh, something of a map. This is a you know, a curious map in that uh, it doesn't actually show the river, uh, but it shows Indians who live along the river. And it, it, Amazingly, uh, 
had it right. I mean, here are the, uh, the Amish the Missouri Indians there. Uh, um, and the old say, so you know, it's kind of you know, a couple hundred miles up the river there. Uh, the Oto, uh, the Pawnees, uh, the, the Omaha. You know, they knew all these guys were up there. They just didn't exactly know what that river that they lived along looked like. Uh, and then by the uh, uh, 17, uh, late 1720s, uh, uh, they were kind of able to actually kind of create a map of the Missouri River. And this is one of the earliest ones that we have, again, showing most of these Indian nations. And, and, and this was kind of the Missouri River. It was a very convenient place. I mean, here are the Rocky Mountains, and very conveniently they stopped and allowed the Missouri River to pass. <laughs> Something called Mark Bush Passion uh, So, uh, and by the time, you know, the Lewis and Clark went up the river, uh, uh, they had the best map uh, that was available to them. Uh, and this was a map that was done in 1795 by a man named James Mackay. And, uh, and, he, and he had a, and he had an interesting fellow named John Evans, who uh, actually went up to the Van Den villages, uh, not for the usual reasons, to steal everything they possibly could from them, but because they somehow thought they were Welshmen, you know, who had come over, you know, with the times of King Maddox and were actually out in the West. Uh, that didn't turn out to be true, but, uh, but James Mackay made the best map of the Missouri River up to that time. And if you wonder why, you know, when uh, Lewis and Clark entered Terra Incognita, it wasn't for 1,500 miles. They were there like the, every stream uh, that lay ahead, and every island just about that they were going to encounter. They had a great deal of knowledge. And then uh, beyond the Mandan villages, uh, uh, they knew that somewhere up there, and it, it's off of their map even, that somewhere up there, off their map, was a river called the Yellowstone. And, and that was that was the geographical knowledge of the West at the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition. We all know about uh, uh, the famous journals of Lewis and Clark, uh, a million words written about the West, one of the most extraordinary of uh, this expeditions of discovery of all time. But to me, one of those amazing accomplishments was what William Clark did uh, in his map uh, We We go from a map like this. And then when William Clark came back, he drew by hand this map of, of the Missouri River as he understood it. This only, uh, uh, and so he just literally uh, produced one of the greatest uh, cartographic achievements uh, in history. Uh, this map uh, was drawn in 1810, and by that time he was in charge of the Indian affairs for the whole Missouri River Valley. And, and every person who was going up the Missouri River stopped by his office at Fort Combine Street in St. Louis. And if it's somebody like John Coulter who had just come back from the upper Missouri River, you know, he, he'd walk up to this map with Clark and tell him, you know, about uh, things that he knew, like he was the first person to see the Yellowstone area, the thing Yellowstone Park, et cetera. So, you know, this is just an extraordinary piece of cartography. And uh, this is, uh, and, and so, you know, if you want 25 words or less uh, to say what well, Lewis and Clark accomplished, it's this. They just took a big blank spot on the map and added this speed thing. Uh, and, uh, and to me, uh, of all the things that most intrigued me about Lewis and Clark, it was their description of the Missouri River uh, that fascinated me the most. Uh, uh, this is the river that they saw is a river that even today it's almost impossible to get our minds around. But no one ever gave us a clearer picture of it than less than five themselves in the rediscovery of this river. Now, I, I have the pleasure to month work with a geographer at the University of Missouri named James D. Harmon. And he did a rather brilliant thing. He found a 180-year-old GIS database. Uh, it turned out that all the first land surveyors in Missouri all stopped at the banks of the Missouri River. So 
if you just patched all that together uh, uh, in a map, uh, you would have the earliest surveyed map of the Missouri River by a good 50 or 60 years over the next one that we had compared with the Missouri River Commission series maps in the 1870s. And not only that, but they surveyed about uh, 80 or 90 islands along the river. So uh, by putting all that together, Jim essentially uh, recreated a, to 95 degree accuracy the river that was in Clark Trout. And it just made a stunning impact on the way that person read the list of Clark journals. But I, I don't know if you've tried reading from Clark. Clark did most of the journal keeping in Missouri. It seems the dullest stuff in the world when you read it. But all of a sudden, when you're looking at it, uh, off in the west, slightly southwest, or all that, a bluff comes next to the river, and you look at these maps, and there it is, exactly there. All of a sudden, it just makes a world of difference. Uh, but uh, this is not quite uh, the cover of geographic. <laughs> unfortunately, that was the month I unfortunately discovered this missing Afghan woman and had an extra long article on gags that sort of unfortunately kind of knocked us out of that. But nonetheless, Jim did have, uh, uh, and they did do an article, a friend of ours, Kathy Salter, who lives in the Columbia area, wrote this article about uh, Jim's maps uh, that he produced. And also they're on the web, and so this site is still up uh, if you go to the University of Missouri website and, and you'll find just some fantastic things. And if you're into GIS and ArcView and all that, all of his coverages and shape files and all that are available too. And then eventually we print out this book called The Atlas of Voice and Cloth from Missouri that sort of combined uh, an analysis of the journals along with his maps. And, uh, one of the first things about it is just it gives us a unique picture of the way the Missouri River looked. Here is one rare case where the Missouri River has not changed its course uh, since Lewis and Clark passed by. Uh, right here is Herman, Missouri, kind of way. Uh, and this is the way uh, Jim's map of the Missouri River. Uh, as you can see, it's just vastly wider than it was then. Uh, you can uh, just tell. It is. And um, the one thing that you could put in this river was sandbars, but since it's in the same place, if you have the uh, Missouri River Commission maps, uh, you can add that layer of kind of complexity. And you can just see what a, what a totally different uh, river it was before uh, the channelization took place. And uh, and here's, and here's some quantification of these changes. Uh, today, the total water area is, uh, is close to 7,000 uh, acres. Back then, it was, uh, it was you know, like uh, almost 181,000 acres. Uh, the average width of it, it was it over three times wider uh, back in those days uh, than it is now. Um, and if you uh, that was such a nice slide. It's really nice. Oh, I'm going to do something. And the total area, this is wetlands and, uh, and the actual surface of the water together. And here's just where you can see the profound uh, losses, you know, just a profound ecological disaster uh, <laughs> that the Chinese of the Missouri River in the main in terms of just the environment and the habitat uh, that was lost as a result of it. Uh, and you know, you think of it, well, there's money today, you know. But it was in Clark even investigated that. He said, you know, that the water we drink, uh, you know, contains a half uh, a glass of slime, you know, for every full wine glass. You know, that's how much a pint of water, that's, that's how much ooze was will uh, sift out of the kind of water. The water back then was very cool because it came from the Rockies and it had a very earthy kind of gritty finish to it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but believe it or not today, because of the dams and everything, today it would take gallons of water to produce a half a pound of glass of those ooze, as you call it. Uh, 
And uh, it was just an amazingly unending place. This is a, a wonderful picture by Charles Catlin. And you can just literally see this whole banks of the river just heaving in, you know, trees and all. And sometimes, you know, you keep the person up all night, just the, the grind and the logs of it. And there would be huge rafts of logs that could block up an entire uh, channel of the river uh, called a morass. Uh, uh, and, and really, you know, you, you kind of hear about the Lizzie Clark expedition starting uh, up somewhere around the, the first time they encountered Indians or all that. But really, the great miracle of the Lizzie Clark expedition is they ever even made it that far in the first place. Uh, that uh, that 55 foot long keelboat that uh, Mary Weather Lewis had built uh, on the Ohio River was about the perfectly long kind of vessel to take up the Missouri River. It was way too long. Uh, it, it, it drew something like four feet of water. Uh, it had a rounded bottom on it. And, and all of that just spelled a nightmare. Uh, on June the 4th, that's the worst place I've seen on the larger side. A sandbar making out two thirds of the way across the river. Uh, uh, Sam collecting, farming bars, and washing away the boat struck and turned. She was near over setting. Uh, we saved her by some extraordinary exertions of our party, ever ready to endure any fatigue for the promotion of the enterprise. What was happening was that the river was so powerful that we literally picked sandbars up and moved them just before your very eyes. And if the boat touched the sandbar at all, it would immediately ground. The current would swing it out. Uh, uh, perpendicular to the current, it immediately began to list, and this is one of those cases where everybody was out the boat just keeping it from swamping, uh, and, uh, and it was literally, when you talk about that legendary teamwork of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, this is where it was fun, it makes it like this. Uh, here's just a, a particularly lousy day uh, of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, uh, right up here is Blue Grand for Henderson, Missouri. But, uh, well, you know, they describe uh, uh, fast water collapsing bank, shallow water is the worst spark has ever seen in sandbars, and this is the third day in the movie saying that. I said, yes, you should see the bed. Uh, and the cubicle means, and, uh, it nearly oversets uh, just a, almost every day in this section. Uh, and you know, there they almost lost the, you know, they barely saved the field board. Here they almost lost it again. It was just, especially through that section between uh, uh, the Grand River and the Kansas River, uh, was the deadliest stretch of the Missouri River. And then, you know, the day after, Terry saw one of the worst things I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, and we passed up through a very bad part of the river, the worst moving sands I ever saw. The current was so strong that their oars, their sails, even under a stiff breeze, couldn't stem it, and they were obliged to take out their cardinal rope and literally drag uh, the keel boat up the river uh, with uh, with cardinal ropes. Uh, during the good sections, they were making something like almost 12 miles a day. But through here, it dropped down to half that uh, as they just labored against this river. And uh, there were a French boat, boat about them, the Pierre Cruzat, the famous feather, considered this stretch to be the worst in the Missouri River. Now, this is over in Saline County, near the old Missouri, uh, and little Osage uh, villages. We're just right across from. from these islands that we're talking about. Um, and then, uh, up across from the lake over where they were camped, uh, by then they literally wore their oars out, and they literally had to stop, pick out the proper trees, and actually make a new set of oars. Uh, and during this time, Clark decided to measure uh, the speed of the Missouri. The first guy to ever do this, and, and he came up with a figure of 23.66 miles an hour for the current. Now, people, just don't believe this, that this is even possible. 23.6, that's as fast as water goes over the river in the Falls. Uh, that's impossible. 
Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, that was not the only measurement that Clark made. Uh, he uh, set up a course uh, that, and he, he used uh, a two pole chain, 16 and a half feet uh, times two. And they set out a course that was 48 poles, six feet long, about 796 feet. And he measured how fast the river uh, flowed uh, uh, in that course. And he did it in five different places. And so he and actually the first person that gives us a cross section of the currents of the river. And you can see on that one cross section, just how variable those currents, all the way from these monstrous roaring currents, all the way down to something that's just halfway comprehensible around only six miles. But this was the fastest stretch of the Missouri River, far faster than the river is today. Uh, people think the river today is faster. That's not true. It was much faster back in those days. And uh, you know, and sometimes when folks you know study the river, uh, they just can't get their minds around that. You know, uh, one person uh, you know, with a very respectable agency. Said Clark had to be wrong on that. He had to make fabs instead of coals. And so that, and he said that, that Clark used a log line, which was not a you know a fabs. Well they had one on board, but clearly Clark didn't do that. He really had his two pole chain he was using. And so this person comes up with a more a figure he believes is more, you know, more acceptable to modern notions of how fast he really was. But unfortunately, uh, Clark, you know, was giving us a cross section several different times. So when it says the river is going 23 miles an hour, uh, there's good reason to believe it. Uh, but uh, and one thing that they were saying, you know, here's just another one of these dead weight sections, swift roaring water over uh, rolling sands. And at one point they just literally said, that the river sounded like an immense waterfall. You know, that's something you know, the river that people have all been going through. It's just a river that none of us have ever seen. I can't even imagine how this could be. But they literally would spend nights where the river was so much noise. It was just deafening. And uh, Bobber, you know, painted a the Carl Bachman painted a painting that comes almost as close to capturing what this is like as I've seen. But it, it's just uh, hard to get your mind around. And then, when they arrived at the Platte River, all of a sudden the river completely changes its personality. Uh, the Platte River was regarded by navigators back in that day as, uh, as much part of, as much a part as the equinox to, uh, to sea going mariners. Uh, from here starts the upper river, and here is where you leave the lower river. Uh, uh, and Lewis, in his usual comparative language, actually they measured uh, the comparative velocities of the uh, Missouri River in the Platte. And, and, and this is just a fantastic thing about these guys: is all the things that they're doing and thinking about to try to describe. Uh, is it truly a scientific expedition? And uh, where the Black River is the Missouri River, it, it does so in a kind of current that's eight miles an hour, and it literally pushes the current of the Missouri River to the opposite shore. Uh -huh. uh, and it compresses it to one third of its previous width. Uh, but above the Black River, the river slows down to 3.5 miles an hour. It kind of changes its personality entirely. Uh, this is the Platte River of Nebraska, the Malawi, the famous Platte River. Uh, but today, you know, how many trickle in the Missouri River uh, because of all the irrigation and everything that's going on. And that's why I, I think that most people have never gotten a <coughs> around how much water we've taken away from the Missouri River. How much water never makes it to the Missouri River. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, below the Platte Mouth, uh, they again, you know, kind of gave a notion of the currents. Uh, 5.5 5 to the Platte and Kansas River, 6 to 7 miles in that gauntlet section between the, the Kansas and Osage, and then slightly slower between the Osage and the Mouth. 
Uh, and Mark thinks just one of these observations that I think is kind of mind blowing. He says, the Missouri River at this place, just above the entrance of the plant, and this is in 1806, does not appear to contain more water than it did a thousand miles above this. Uh, the evaporation must be immense. In the last thousand miles, this river receives a lot, the water of 20 rivers and many creeks, several of the rivers large, and the size of this river and the quantity of the river does not appear to increase at all. <coughs> it's just an observation. You know? Who knows what it really means or what it causes it. But this, this is just the kind of stuff this guy is always kind of thinking about and, and making intriguing points about. Uh, and you know, and for all of those folks, you know, uh, the generic National Park Service site, which I always used to just hate everything I saw it, showed me really in St. Louis in their first incident, in their first important uh, moment coming when they meet uh, the Otello in, in Omaha Indians. You know. Well, there were the words that so far we've experienced more difficulty from the navigation of the Missouri than danger from the savages. How many of you hear that? How many of you hear the story told that way? Uh, you know, and, and the other thing I like about Lacey Park is that they just absolutely felt like they were traveling through the Garden of Eden. They just felt like they were. Uh, the words like handsome, beautiful, you know, just occur with all the journals. Keepers. They knew what a magical place they were seeing uh, at this time. And, um, gosh, I don't think I've got the right shirt here. Uh, uh, these are just landmarks. Can I just, can we look at my, I may have wrong, but look at them all. So, pretty much it's taking me to come here. So, but you know, um, 
by uh, late June, June 26th and 28th, they spent uh, one of their long three-day breaks at the mouth of the Fall River uh, in, in Kansas City. Uh, and when they came back on September 15th, 1806, uh, one of the rare places they actually stopped and got out of the boat and climbed up to the top of the hill was was that overlook. Uh, it's not me, is it? Uh, that me? Oh well, there you go. Uh, um, but, but this is just one of those rare places that we just literally say the captains were at it. Their feet were standing there. Uh, and but that's where the beautiful uh, statue is of the uh, I think the favorite of all the list of like statues that were in the uh, And Michael Haynes did this wonderful painting uh, it was it's a kind of a mixture of all of them, uh, of both September 16th and uh, June 26th and 28th. This is the only place they were probably seeing uh, the Carolina parakeet, which, which I rather imagine must be, must, you know, it's just a shame that such a new bird was coming to extinction. And it was some huge blocks, and this was the only time on the journey they actually started seeing them this year. And the first time they saw an elk, uh, they got partly sick of eating milk by the time they took them over. The first one they saw uh, was in this area. And then as they move on beyond into the Great West Hills region and the other river, that, uh, and these are Charles Kaplan Payne uh, up through there. And, and finally, you get up into the, uh, into the uh, Missouri Breaks country, the, the scenes of visionary enchantment that the Cameron and Lewis wrote so eloquently about. And, and by then, you know, they were just, uh, they were what some people called the Americans, started getting the great, uh, the great other planes where, uh, where just uh, literally buffalo by the communities could be seen and, 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 and they could take, and they could spend days or whatever crossing. Um, and of course, they encountered some 40 Native American tribes. Again, just absolutely in a full glory. And experience them at this time in um, um, the Great Plains Indians. And so, you know, it was an extraordinary mission of discovery, but, but also at the same time, because they were there, you know, all of this was pretty much doomed. You know, because they, they were there to, just, to explore the Louisiana Purchase, you know, this incredible land deal that uh, Thomas Jefferson made in 1803 when he bought. 800,000 square miles of land from the Emperor Napoleon and less than three cents an acre. And not roundly criticized by Congress for doing it, but it literally uh, was the opening chapter of a manifest destiny in the West. And we've all seen images like this where just uh, the, uh, the miners and the sappers, the Butterfield Stagecoach, the Arkenbound Constant, the Ride on the Pony Express, the three lines of the uh, transcontinental railroads, uh, all, you know, laid out according to divine destiny, you know, a, a gigantic floating blonde woman, you know, the uh, And this painting is 1880, you know, 1880, the American, the great American John, they'd already been a friend of Since, um, and if you ever really want to reenact 19th century school teaching, this lady is a school teacher, so oh, wow. <laughs> she's actually carrying a McGuffey reader and she is helping to uh, string the transcontinental telegraph. Uh, but as fetching as she does, you know, this isn't the way it played out. But as a result of these processes, you know, all these millions of buffalo, as far as the eye can see, you know, so see we're replaced by millions of cattle, you know, as far as the eye can see. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we're just going to kind of move onward you know, from the river and the world that they experienced to the river that we have created since then. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, we've all seen these paintings by Gary Lucia, a phenomenally talented artist who lives in Washington, Missouri. Uh, these spectacular uh, steamboats of this era, you know. Uh, 
and you know, I was kind of leaving through my photographs, and, and they are indeed uh, spectacular. Uh, some of them are weird, you know. But, you, you know anything about the shoe guy that used to come up and down the river? <laughs> uh, but you know, that river was hard on them. And they didn't look like beautiful carriages and carriages. Mostly these boats look like they've been rowing hard and put away. That is like they sell them more than five years long. And, uh, and the number of boats uh, that sunk in the Missouri River is just phenomenal. That's up in the hundreds. Here's just a, a, the first plate from the canal point. I don't know exactly how far this goes, but but, it, but there's about another six or seven plates, and they're all just a chock full of steamboat racks. Here's up around the Kansas City area, and I think that's the Arabia there, of course. So if you ever want to know what these steamboats were delivering all these folks out the rest, you just go to the Arabia Museum and see what the plan is. And, you know, it was the desire to make the Missouri River more navigable that, that led to a great movement. A lot of it was in Kansas City. A lot of the promoters for improvement of navigation and improvement of the Missouri River uh, far uh, riverboat traffic uh, began you know, with the slogan to Kansas City to the sea, you know. And the vision was this great heartland, inland waterway system. Going up the Ohio, going up the uh, Illinois, uh, going in all the rivers that empty into the Mississippi, the Arkansas, and the Missouri, all of, all of these rivers navigable. All of this a great uh, interlocking system you know, that would elevate this region you know, to, to uh, in world commerce and be the basis of our prosperity. Uh, this was a vision you know, behind uh, the making the Missouri River navigable. Uh, and uh, essentially, the vision to do this uh, was first articulated in the, 18, the 1880s by an uh, Army Corps of Engineers colonel named Charles Souter. And Charles Souter came up with a plan for how you peg the Missouri River down and make it navigable. Uh, this is a river you know, before you know the, the, the navigation where it starts. And it's one, Promoter once said, "The whole the Missouri River is good part now is in the port to spawn the farmer to commit suicide." <laughs> uh, but uh, what he did was by a series of pylons uh, extending out into the river, uh, along with either woven mats at first to find a rock to keep banks from washing away, he constricted the sides sides of the river. Uh, to what it is today, you know, from something like 2,000 feet wide, you know, and it was once 3,600 feet wide. Um, and, uh, and also during this, they pulled up the incredible snags that have been lodged in the river over time. There was such a snag that took the Arabia down. Sometimes you could pull snags out as big as houses, you know, with these great snag pulling boats. And then they would build these dike. Uh, uh, these dikes out into the river, and, and, and the river would silt in around, and, and that's what narrowed the channel of the river. And the same time it silted in, it directed uh, the speed of the water out towards the middle, and it dug the channel down. And the dream was to have a nine-foot deep navigation channel that went all the way to Sioux City. That was the dream that they were trying to achieve. Uh, and so here you can see it happening. Here you can see the modern river being born. You can see all the land that's silting in around those dikes to the point where all these dikes were invisible put up until the flood of 93 and after the flood of 93 you could, uh, they, they all washed out and you could, you could see lots of these structures which were still there and so this produced uh, the modern river that we know today uh, and here's a kind of a graphic of what happened you had all of these systems of, of wetlands along with a channel with, with many different side uh, shoots is what they call them. It, it wasn't truly a braided channel, but it had a main channel and then channel, side channels that went around the islands. And so they reduced it from this to essentially this ditch that you see in these techniques. I mean, it's a beautiful ditch. It's, uh, 
It's certainly still a great joy to be out there, as you all know. Um, and then, you know, we come, you all, I guess you all write a quick song about that. Well, I mean, uh, well, you know, it's the basis of everything. Uh, and it's, the next song coming is the unwed child of the flood control act of 1944, which was a very ugly old marriage, this marriage between the Lord Sloan and uh, General Lewis. Uh, uh, Sloan was a land record guy. What he wanted to do was use the Missouri River uh, to uh, create irrigation. Uh, uh, there was a Colonel Pick was a, uh, General Pick was uh, an ammunition guy. He wanted to see that man put channel from the Sioux City down to the mouth of the river. Uh, and these two guys had to bring them up together after World War II was over. Uh, FDR was confronted with probably millions of GIs uh, returning home. And he wanted to put all these guys to work in massive uh, public works projects. And for the Missouri River, the two plans that were proposed was one, uh, use the Missouri River to just irrigate the entire upper plains. Uh, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. And Colonel Pickett said, many, many, many. And so they on the classic government way, we'll just do both. And that's what happened. And uh, so here we have up here, you know, and these tax things are absolutely lovely. This is, this is, uh, General Pick's River going you know, from all the way from uh, Gavis Point, the city, 750 miles down to the to the mouth. Here are all the little limbs up here that, that uh, William Sloan was uh, for, for, for irrigation of crops. And uh, this is just a kind of a hundred uh, map of this whole thing, but actually dating back to that period. And you can see even down in our area down in here. Just everywhere, every every stream flowing in Missouri just about got a pan plant for it of some kind. Uh, and uh, so the vision was, especially up there in the high plains, is you know, you take an area like this, and then with, and then here are the, the the old the modern versions, you know, the 1930s and 40s versions of your log cabin pioneers on this kind of living in a car paper shack. And there the water is, and they're being irrigated into their crops and all that. So eventually, you know, there's an agricultural paradise up there. And meanwhile, from Sioux City down, uh, there would be a thriving barge industry. Uh, you know, the development, the snapping of the river. And, uh, and, it, and it's a good vision. It's a grand vision that drives all of this. But it didn't have quite worked out that way. The Rivers of Harper's Act in 1945 is where actually for the first time there was a, a mandate to create a 300-yard wide, nine-foot deep channel uh, for the purposes of navigation. And also, you know, the farmers bought into it, but all of a sudden now the Missouri River wasn't just moving all over the place. All of a sudden now the river was in one place, so their farmland was less liable to destruction by the river. Uh, and then, you know, to uh, facilitate the flood control, they built uh, about six mainstream uh, dams uh, above Sioux City, starting at Gavin's Point and uh, going on up through uh, Big Bend, where the Great Bend of the Missouri River was. And, uh, William and Clark took days to get around, even though the bank of it was only a few miles wide. Uh, and, 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 and the various mainstream dams. Uh, I like the fact that the picture here is little faucets. Uh, unfortunately, this summer, all these little faucets were on as much as possible. Uh, uh, anyway, it's as vast and as precious as the Missouri River watershed uh, looks, and this is also the fault of the Louisiana Purchase country. Uh, it's amazingly little water in Missouri, comparatively speaking. Uh, this map is based entirely just on volume of water. And, uh, and the Missouri River has, uh, of course, way, way less than the Mississippi, even less than in Ohio, and even less than Illinois. Uh, and 
the big dilemma for the Missouri River has been that there has never been enough water in it for both of them. General Pitt and Mr. Sloan. We couldn't do both things. Never have been, and this is what we've been arguing over ever since. So, uh, and this is just a, a little stretch. I'll, I'll come back at the end a little bit of Pitt and Sloan. But, uh, you know, thanks to you guys and all the work you've done, uh, there's been an amazing growth of awareness of the Missouri River and even the notion that the river is actually kind of a fun place to be out on, you know, and in a beautiful place. Um, but, it, but, but the life of a river rapids is bad, you know. It's usually a very small scale. There's a the small John boats and, and, uh, and, and sometimes we fire the glass boats for folks trying to escape the lake of the Ozarks and other places right. where all the waves have become too big. Right. So it's set kind of low level, but it's still very popular, especially when the sandbars are out, which Unfortunately, they haven't been for the last three or four years, but that may change. And then, uh, uh, talking about steamboat wrecks, here, here is a monument to the one Mungus wrecks. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, this place called Bogans, near uh, Cooper's Landing, uh, in our neck of the woods. Uh, and I'm uh, waiting for the man in the fort to Mr. Catfish uh, Scott Mountain. Uh, was responsible for wrecking of these boats. Sometimes I ran And you know, and my friend Brett Duffer at Roachport actually uh, started a, a kayak and canoe rental business in Toronto for several years. Uh, it was a growing business until all this high water kind of came along. Uh, and there's even a, a gentleman who's written a, a guidebook to paddling the entire Missouri River. It's a, a fascinating thing. I mean, uh, Maybe we got to write a little thing for the bus guy that he brought and we tried to do like that myself. Uh, Could you go back one? What's that? Could you go back one? If I can change the whole show, I can sure go back. <laughs> it's by Dave Miller, David Elmore, the complete family. Uh, a guy that, and it takes you all the way down, it takes you all the lakes. Quite a quite a thing for me. Modern day list of quite a uh, and, uh, and then, you know, this is just one of the most exciting times in general, uh, and probably in the last several decades, to be really beside the Missouri River, just because of all the interesting uh, sorts of projects that are uh, The Corps of Engineers has got very different kinds of mitigation projects or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and in some cases, Department of Conservation. They have something going on for huge stretches of the river these days. And, and here is almost an idealized vision of what the river could be. Uh, this is uh, Eagle Bluffs of Boone County, but, uh, but the city of Columbia was originally going to, to run their wastewater in a giant 10 foot pipe straight into the Missouri River, but then they changed their mind and tried to do these wetlands where you have natural filtration back cattails and such. And so they're trying that to the city of Pumpkin's wastewater is being run through several of these wetlands. And then you have the Eagle Bus Conservation Department wetlands, which are now a major stopping point for uh, millions of migratory birds. We live right across it, and you can just see bees by the tens of thousands rising out of this place. And every once in a while, you know, a, a trumpeter swan or something show up, and all the bird watchers just go crazy and go down there. Uh, and then you've got the Cape Trail running along. This is almost a uh, good pass for uh, an idealized vision of what the river management could be. Uh, and uh, one of their bolder experiments was to try to create a, a new chute and get the river back to the complexity it once had. Uh, and they created this chute uh, near Lisbon Bottoms, uh, uh, the bus. Uh, the big problem was that too much water started flowing through it, it looked like the whole river changed its course, so they didn't fight it. So, uh, and then a few years ago, they did this odd uh, project where they must have spent millions upon millions of dollars gouging these similar, similar circular indentations into the bank to, uh, to provide spawning grounds and, flat, and slack water for the danger of uh, palate surgeons and such. And I don't know how much money they spent on this thing, but you can't see a trace of these things. They're totally uh, 
some yeah. stuff going on that stretch. Uh, and, I, and my stretch in the river here, you know, they just did this. <coughs> I mean, you can't see a single bit of evidence of it. Uh, yeah. But you know, when you, uh, there are all these talks about these turns and uh, Alan Sturgeon, uh, et cetera, you know, for, you know, some of us folks who live in the lower river, all that is is just William Sloan wearing bird feathers. Uh, it's still the same fight over whether we keep the water above the dams or uh, whether we let it go. And one argument that we have, you know, it's, it's admittedly hard to argue that we've got a vibrant topo industry. In fact, I mean, I would be very to see topos go by in the water. I think there's only about two or three that even when we were in New York. Uh, but it is, the water of the Missouri River is important for the middle section of the Mississippi River between St. Louis and the Ohio River. It, it contributes a significant portion of the water to support that, which is one of the most busy navigation channels uh, in America, if not the world. So, uh, we're in a continuous battle sometimes, and it will be casting in terms of protecting endangered species, you know. But it's just still that same old battle uh, that's followed with the fact that there just isn't enough water in the Missouri River. And for us down here, it always works the exact opposite of the way they want it. If there's too much water up north, then they dump it on us in exactly the moment we don't want it. And if there's not enough water up north, then the reservoirs are going to die. You know, we don't have enough so no matter how it works, it doesn't seem to work much to our advantage. And, and, and I know our agency you know, is in a state of perpetual water and recording. And it's back to you, know, and we're supported by our senator, the senator, and the governor. And this, this battle is probably going to go on forever. Or at least until it's finished. But, uh, of course, there's the work you're doing. Lewis and Clark coming, you know, there's probably a better thing you can do than sort of clean up your front yard, you know, get ready for all the visitors they thought were going to be coming to check this out. And uh, I think, you know, how many years ago it was that uh, a fellow named Chad Rocky uh, bought this boat, you know, that he'd been using in the Mississippi to collect crabs, so he bought it up at Cooper's Landing and, and spent several days there, but it, it just it started an amazing phenomenon. Uh, of course, you all want to preserve your belief. Uh, what was that, 2003, 2002? When did Chad first come over? About 2001, you know. Well, that's when this country dates for me. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, just what a, a fantastic thing. They got a crane on this thing, you can lift whole automobiles from the river bank and, and hold refrigerators and things like that to get it better there. And they, they get this, well, you know, you go to their website, you know, which I have several times. I, when I first started doing this back in 2005, was, you know, that this was, they had uh, over a thousand volunteers and 41 tons of fresh, et cetera, whatever. Right? These numbers are just going through the ceiling, in some sense. It's just a uh, phenomenal. How many tons of trash they pull out of this river, how many cleanups they're doing. Um, and the length of them uh, throughout the whole navigable extent, all of this is happening. And this Russian day to kind of get us right up to the United So it's just a phenomenal organization that does just such wonderful work. Uh, it's, it's one of the really good news things that's happening on the Missouri River. Uh, and uh, I guess you all know how to get a hold of the publishing now. Uh, but anyway, you know, uh, you know, Lisa Clark, you know. Uh, went up the river in 1840, this fuel boat, and then uh, uh, came back down the river in the 18th and went the roads. And, uh, um, and who knows when another adventure like that's going to be reenacted. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think Meriwether Lewis still has said about the greatest thing anybody ever said about the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. This is immense river so far as we have the other waters one of the fairest portions of his world. Nor do I believe that there is in the universe a similar extent of country equally fertile, well watered, and exactly by such a number of magnetic experience. Well said, my man, there were well said. And thank you very much.
questions? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we're playing up.
but they are anticipating more traffic on the river. We want more recreation. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of go hand in hand. I don't think, I don't yeah. think the amount of traffic they got is going to interfere with that much. No, it only bothers you if you're a canoe and pass one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's totally different being on a river when the car goes by from being on a lake because the wake hits the banks and then comes back and you that barge will pass and you will still you will get slammed if you're out in the middle of the river. Well, going down to the Mississippi on the pilot, you didn't affect the money really that much. You almost got killed. There, 
basically wouldn't be anything that would have been that uh, recreation in specific areas. But, you know, uh, and there's not much recreation here in Kansas City. But when you start going up there, where you get to Omaha, they've got a, they've got a marina in Nassau County. Uh, and, and farther up, there's a lot more uh, personal recreation on the river and fewer barges. Even in St. Joe, you know. Uh, in, in Kansas City, there's actually, uh, Kansas City, Kansas has had a plan. Uh, the Port Authority has a plan. Uh, Berkeley Park and Sugar Creek has a plan, all for marinas. Those plans have been in process for a long time, if they ever happen, you know, that's, that's something we try to work towards. There's a funny caveat about the Missouri River, and you can't make plans for it, but you can make plans to regulate right in the river. And if you're out there, especially sharing it with the Tobos, you almost have to have a sandbar that you can retreat to the Tobo for the time. The same thing with the bank is going to be slumped. Well, that's, but, that's know, where you know, a lot of those dikes you know, come in handy, yeah, because but you know, and they make great party islands, you know. There's nothing better than a river island party. But you know, for the last four years, it hasn't been a Santa Barbara visible because the river just been on the bank full. They don't have any cycles like that. And now it's like, they it, it put the, the government on guys, those four out of business. It's, you just can't predict what the river's going to do. It's going to go through uh, wet cycles and dry cycles. And all that's going to profoundly affect them. I've seen it happen about three or four times back in the 1980s. There used to be enormous parties on this one island and over there island. There would be boats long and three rows thick. Uh, then the water came up during the 1990s. That whole crowd just vanished. You never saw them again. Mm -hmm. uh, then in the 1990s, a new crowd started coming out there. Mm -hmm. And now they're all gone. So it's a funny thing, this river. It's not predictable and you can't make a plan long term plans. Yeah. Do we know what the projected revenues are for that, that large traffic compared to recreation? I don't know you. You seem to be in the way that they do the additional 32. Would it be significant compared to the loss of revenue? Well, it is for the people that are using the barges. It's like the company that gets the asphalt uh, delivered by barges. You know, you know it, it is a significant saving as, as opposed to calling it by truck. Uh, but there are lots of considerations with it that you don't get with a truck, mainly uh, flow, money. You know, you've got as much water that the a lot of the river, especially from here up river, uh, was closed all summer. And uh, the flow was so high that barges couldn't make it up anyway. You know, that's another thing about controlling the flow, uh, because the barges have to, it's, it's easy enough to go down river, but you got to be able to come up river at, you know, at an economically feasible rate where you're, you know, not burning all your fuel every 10 miles. So. It's the trail. The original feasibility study estimated 80 million metric tons being shipped by barge up to Missouri River. It's never exceeded 8 million. So it, it was vastly overstated. But what most people don't realize is the navigation project wasn't just for commercial use. You have to remember when this was done. This was born right after World War II. They're in the height of the Cold War, and there are significant military uh, resources in the basin. And so the navigation was as much for military navigation as it was for commercial navigation. But it's not a dirty little secret of the Missouri River. It's not talked about, but that was one of the driving emphases for doing the project, was to be able to get warships up in Missouri. But they didn't want to say that to create a hysteria in the world. But it is documented in a lot of good uh, inside documents within the Corps of Engineers that this was a main driving force for having the nine feet navigation channel. You don't need nine feet for barge. You don't That's true. You need nine feet for worse. <coughs> I've not heard that before, but it sounds like something I've got to do. And another thing, all the flooding this year, 
The real problem for the fish here is not the amount of water. The problem was where are our levees? The original Big Sloan project called for the levees to be 5,000 feet apart from left bank to right bank. But Congress never authorized the funding to build those federal levees. So instead of a 5,000 foot wide flood channel, all the levee districts that are formed along the Missouri River, where are those levees? They're right on top of the bank. They're not 5,000 feet apart. So now the river just comes up and keeps going up instead of coming up, spreading out before it can go up again. Flooding is much worse you know, than it used to be. It took much less water to get on the than 51. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You got 350,000 cubic feet in 1995 or more. You got 590 in the 1950s. That's much more. Yeah. 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 What would you say would be your top two uh, spots that you ought to be able to see? Historic or scenic or what? Everybody's got their favorites, but I, I, I love your top two. I love your two What other ones? Yeah, people else. Um, there's for me to tell you where I'm from. I don't know much. I don't know much for me. Pretty good. Yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 